and welcome. You're watching Hat to Hat. I'm Antonina Antosha with UATV. Ukraine and the International Monetary Fund have agreed to prepare a new aid program to be ready after a snap parliamentary election scheduled for July. Just to remind you, the IMF mission was on a visit to Ukraine to assess the fulfillment for conditions for disbursing another $1.3 billion into the current standby arrangement. The IMF said in a statement that the discussions were productive and added that the country's fiscal and monetary policies remain on track. To discuss this and other economic issues in Ukraine, we are joined in the studio today by Timofey Milovanov. He's an honorary president of Kiev School of Economics, associate professor of the University of Pittsburgh, and deputy chairman at Council of the National Bank of Ukraine. So, hello and thank you for joining. Thank you. So on May 23rd, IMF visited Ukraine with another mission and discussed with the Ukrainian um, officials the future program that might be implemented after the snap parliamentary elections and the uh, forming of the new coalition in the government. Now, Ukraine, uh, according to the chairman of the Council of the National Bank of Ukraine, Bohdan Danilishin, might claim to sign a new program not later than in September and October. How realistic is this plan? I don't think it's realistic. Uh, what happened is because of snap elections, the current program is on hold, or there is a formal trigger for this. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, the language of the IMF is diplomatic and has to be considered as such. They will never say that the discussions were not constructive. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the positive uh, language in the statement of the IMF is that the monetary and fiscal policies are on track. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, Ukraine and the Ukrainian government has fulfilled uh, most or majority of the obligations. And if not for the snap elections, I think uh, the mission would have concluded, you know, would have left with the positive assessment. So basically the, the task of the new government that is to be formed is just to keep those things that ha have already what's, been reached on track. What's going to happen is that uh, A, um, the government, the new government, um, the new administration of the president, the new government which is not yet uh, formed and will only be formed after the election, mm -hmm. uh, will have to, you know, and whoever is in charge in the meantime, including the uh, board of the National Bank, the Minister of Finance, uh, the Minister of Economic Development and Trade, and so on and so forth, all the regulators and agencies which are in charge of the policies have to maintain uh, macroeconomic stability, fiscal, uh, r responsible fiscal uh, policies and monetary policies. Mm -hmm. That is one condition which is needed, first of all, for the country, but it's also a precondition for any future cooperation with the IMF. Mm -hmm. Second, the new government and the new administration has to come up with a new program. By the time the government is formed, if we're lucky in September, or maybe in August. October. Uh, yeah, maybe if, uh, that depends uh, on w when the election will take place. We know that the decision about the SNAP uh, elections is going to be debated by the Constitutional Court this week. Yeah. Uh, the first hearing is on June 11th. So there are there might be surprises or decisions there. So de depending whether we have SNAP elections or we don't, in any case, until we have a new government, there will be no new program with the IMF. And the new program is required to move forward. So essentially we are on hold and our job is A, to maintain macroeconomic stability and to behave responsibly and B, to prepare the new program. And the new uh, administration has to work on preparation of the new program right now, already. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, um, the MVF mission that has already left Ukraine but uh, was visiting at the end of May um, claimed that its attention was pretty much drawn by uh, the issue of illegal enrichment. And it is one of Ukraine's obligations um, on the way to forming a new program to kind of, well, not get rid of this issue because it's impossible to get rid of such an issue, but at least to start tackling this problem, how successful could Ukraine get on the way to tackling the issue of illegal enrichment? So there are several important issues for the IMF, always. And let's just uh, be clear about what we use the funds for um, of the IMF for. Okay. They're actually not going to support our budget deficit or some infrastructural project, but um, they go to support the reserves. Uh, of the National Bank of Ukraine, most of the time. Mm -hmm. The IMF program is important because a lot of other help, a lot of other investments, a lot of other um, financial assistance is conditioned on the IMF program. 
And the IMF requires a certain set of parameters which are, in fact, frankly, in our interest. One of them you just mentioned is a critical one, is the law about illegal enrichment. Mm -hmm. what, what is the issue here? It is a, an old precondition. We promise to fulfill it and we actually receive funds for that. Uh, that we will have a law which punishes people who became rich in a criminal way or in an illegal way. Mm -hmm. uh, that law recently has been struck down by the higher courts yes. of Ukraine, right? So the question is now we suddenly reverse as the country, as the country. Of course, we have an explanation because the courts are independent formally and possibly informally, in, in practice. Mm -hmm. We have an explanation, but nonetheless, in the, the contract with the IMF, we promise that that condition will be there. Now we don't have that condition. That's a big problem. It's like reneging on your obligations. You promise to do something, you know, let's say you borrowed money to invest, to build a new house, and instead of that, you don't build a new house. Mm -hmm. That's a problem, whatever the reasons are. So that's important. There are other things which are important, and one of them is, of course, private bank. We'll talk about okay, that. so we'll, we'll, we'll talk. talk. Yeah. But there are five or so conditions which are critical. And illegal enrichment, what can be done is, of course, it's a legislative issue, legislation. Uh, so the new, the new administration has proposed a law. And whether that law will be, first of all, accepted, uh, passed, and implemented mm -hmm. remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. I, I hope it will, because I think uh, it is, in, frankly, in everyone's interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, we all know that <clears throat> the private bank has been nationalized by the government in Ukraine, but then there was a lawsuit filed and the court ruled uh, in favor of the previous owner of the private bank. And now there is controversy uh, appearing around the situation around this bank. And um, Igor Kolomoisky and Gennady Bogolubov are accused of laundering uh, the sum of almost 500 billion U.S. dollars. And it is stated in the uh, Material Analyst Center, uh, Atlantic Council Anders Esland. Uh, now, the article states that the total amount of loans uh, that was driven to some Cypriot banks is actually much higher than the Cypriot's GDP itself. Now, do you know any details of this laundering scheme? Because if it is true, this laundering scheme would be the largest in the history existing. Well, so it depends um, on how we count things. First of all, I've read, um, I've read the materials of the case. Mm -hmm. the, the Atlantic Council or the Aslan's comments rec uh, are reflected or are based on the filing by Privat Bank, the nationalized legal entity Privat Bank, mm -hmm. in the Lavera Chancery Court. Mm -hmm. against uh, a number of corporations, the former owners of the private bank, but also a number of uh, um, people in the United States uh, who uh, used, they are accused of using these funds to acquire real estate and uh, metallurgy plants and some uh, manufacturing plants in mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. So all this uh, $500 billion uh, sum is coming from that uh, um, that um, claim in the court, and uh, I have read, uh, you know, it's 104 pages, it's a lot of material, and I have not been able actually to see that uh, some, maybe I missed it because uh, it was cursory reading, mm. uh, but it might be the case that, um, you know how the counts are added? Simply if uh, I take $10 million and then transfer it through um, 10 accounts from one bank to another bank to another bank, how many cases of money laundering it is? It is 10. Even though it's the same amount, you that's actually still, okay. laundered uh, not uh, ten million dollars, but hundred million dollars. So that's you know that number has to be understood oh, from so the, from the perspective of the legal perspective, right? Mm. So it's a legal claim, and so we need to understand that it's not an economic statement that someone took five hundred billion dollars and moved somewhere. Mm -hmm. No, it's the e uh, and I have not seen that amount in the claim. Okay, so maybe you know. I looked at it again and I have not, so I'm not even convinced. Um, the claim is in fact uh, in the amount of uh, several hundred million dollars. That's what the claim is um, in terms of so damages. So there's no exact number? Um, no exact number, for, it's up to the court to decide. Maybe there is more in the materials, at least what I've seen mm -hmm. in, the, in, in the media. Okay. And I, you know, I encourage everyone to read for yourself um, these hundred pages. What's mm -hmm. interesting in those hundred pages is an explanation of, of what really happened. So there is an accusation so uh, that within the bank there was a uh, sort of shadow bank or unit 
Uh, mm -hmm. And it operated uh, from 2006 to 2016 or so. And the important part of it, why time is important, because it was way before Poroshenko. So there are cases which private bank alleges, they relate to 2008 or to 2010. So that was way beyond, it's under Yanukovych. So it's not, it's not you know, with, um, the, there's evidence that it's a longer, uh, longer story mm -hmm, than just, mm -hmm. uh, it's not a personal Poroshenko versus uh, Bogolubov or mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Kolomoisky. So, and then um, the accusations is the following, that the loans which were given out to the companies, uh, for commercial purposes or for business development, in fact, were not used for those purposes, but were moved uh, overseas and the funds uh, were commingled with other funds or conjoined with other funds and used to buy real estate. And the largest, uh, um, I think, location where is Cleveland, Ohio, where the largest amount of real estate was bought, but it is all over the United States. And there are examples. So out of these 100 pages, 60 or 70 pages are examples of specific buildings or plants that have been bought or sold. What about Cypriot companies that are also Yeah, the, some of that was done through Cyprus companies. Okay, okay so basically the way my, um, the private bank had the Cyprus branch mm -hmm. and, uh, and you can make transfers to Cyprus branch and then from Cyprus branch you can make further transfers. Okay. So there's a, lar a long list of companies uh, which were involved in this. Uh, and the accusation is that most of them or all of them were owned or at least controlled by the former owners of the, of mm -hmm. the bank. Okay. Well, during one of your recent interviews, you said, in a quote here, the economic situation in Ukraine is still developing in an optimistic scenario. It seems that President Zelensky, through certain appointments, rhetoric signals that economic policy will be balanced. In this regard, I think we have a very optimistic scenario. Could you dwell on the scenario itself a little bit longer? Please? So the, the difficulty uh, for you know, for predictions for macroeconomic scenario for Ukraine is that the current administration is not tested in, in the office. Mm -hmm. No one knows exactly how they will behave, what their allegiances are, mm -hmm. what their expertise are, who their team are, is, and so on and so forth. Agreed. Uh, so therefore, you know, with uncertainty is huge. You can have um, totally, you know, disastrous scenario where people don't know what they are doing and you know doing making just incorrect choices or they are just plain corrupt we can have a very optimistic scenario where this is a new wave of uh, politicians coming in who are earnestly trying to change the, the country yeah. and they will do things differently and will improve and i think expectations are towards the positive side uh, of the public and uh, as reflected by the vote but also as reflected even now i think the sentiment the confidence is high the business sentiment is there and that will help Ukraine to navigate through this uncertainty. Part of the economic uh, situation is expectations. If everyone is pessimistic or if everyone is panicking, then there will be a crisis. If we trust that our government is going to uh, proceed in some prudent way and in, in a better way than the previous governments, then maybe there will be less of a crisis, even if some negative things happen, shocks and so on. So when I refer to so far where we are moving according to optimistic scenario, this is, this is my reflection of, of this situation. We still don't know, the government has not been truly tested by any major challenge, mm -hmm. either coming from Russia or from some economic situation or from oligarchic issues or from corruption, something like that. That has not happened. Um, and at the same time, we see that some of the appointments are quite sound. Uh, others also uncertain, like the head of the administration of the president, uh, Bogdan, mm -hmm. he's a lawyer for the private bank, so previously. So there's a question about uh, whether he will behave, you know, within, whether yeah. he has a conflict of interest and how that will develop. But I think there's still, uh, and at least there's no evidence so far about anything negative, about negative scenario. Uh, and I hope, uh, you know, things will be good. We all hope that it will stay this way. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. That was Timofey Milovanov. He's an honorary president of Kiev School of Economics, associate professor of the University of Pittsburgh and deputy chairman at Council of the National Bank of Ukraine. Thank you so much for watching UATV. Stay tuned for more.